Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're here in person or virtually, we just want to say welcome. You're about to hear an incredible message from our senior pastor, Chad Braswell. But before we do that, I just want to encourage you to like, comment, and share this video so other people can join as well. Thank you again for being with us today, and we hope you enjoy this message. Am I on? It's one of those moments you're so focused on getting things situated, you forget. It's use rare. It was me. I didn't turn it on. And I said, I was wondering, how are you doing? Good to see you this morning, church. I'm excited about what God's going to do. How many people have been leaning in during this time of prayer and fasting? <laughs> Hopefully that's you. I, uh, I have certainly been hearing God, and there's been breakthroughs in my personal life, but I believe that God is wanting to do it corporately, not just in me and through me, but in us and through us. Isn't that right? And so, you know, I was thinking about how amazing the, the, the playlist or set list was this morning for, for praise and worship, and I was thinking about how amazing it is to be able to gather together. And uh, I'm just so thankful that our words don't end where the lyrics end. You see what I'm saying? And let me just kind of quickly just say this. Look at our praise and our worship. It's helped and guided by what's on the screen, but it's supposed to do more by opening our heart to allow us to say things that maybe it doesn't even say. Is that, is that good? And that's kind of what prayer and fasting does. It allows us to lean in and say more. And so if you're joining us for the first time in person or online, I want to encourage you today. You know what? Uh, we have something we used to talk a lot about called the three-week challenge. And uh, I really believe that God does amazing things. And if you would join us for the next two weeks in a row, just see what God will do in your life when you decide to make him a priority. Uh, because I believe that God is trying to do a new thing in this new year. And uh, if we want to see new, we've got to do something new. Is that good? We are well on our way into our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And, and we're encouraging our church family to lean into what God is doing this year. And uh, if you're... If you're just joining us, let me kind of catch you up real quickly, but first, we're going to pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your church. We're thankful for your son. Lord, we take this time this morning, Father, to, to slow things down and to turn things down and to try and listen to you as we lean in. Father, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The quickest way I can. Let me try and catch you up on what we're doing. We've been in this 21 days of prayer and fasting, and so let me kind of help. Today, I know the last couple of weeks we've been talking more fasting. Today, I want to talk about prayer, but what I do want to do is at least catch those up that may be joining us for the first time. So what is the spiritual discipline of fasting? The goal of fasting is intimacy with God and clarity in hearing his voice. Biblical fasting always has to do with eliminating distractions for a spiritual purpose. Say a spiritual purpose. See, look, at if we're not doing it for a spiritual purpose, it's not the biblical fasting and prayer that we're talking about, right? And so biblically, we see fasting is abstaining from food while those fasting dedicate more time to seek and pursue the things of God. It's a way to say, God, I'm serious about what you want from my life. I'm not willing to continue just as I have been. I want a fresh touch. I want to lean in. And so the practice of prayer and fasting is laying down the pleasures of the earth to take up the pleasure of heaven. It also enables us to recognize the goodness of God and align our hearts with his through prayer. At the end of the day, it's not what I want, God. It's your will be done. But how can I do your will if I don't fully understand it? I need to know where you're leading me. I need to understand where you're guiding me. And I don't need to know why for everyone that needs to know everything. We don't need to know everything. I just want to know the next step. I just want to be able to take the next step, being faithful with what you're calling me to, yes? And so we are putting to death our earthly urges by prayer and fasting, and we're quieting our worlds. We're turning up our attention and refocusing our spirit on the things of God. Has anyone already, like I've already mentioned, has anyone already experienced a breakthrough 
maybe a deeper, more intimate relationship with God, yeah? Uh, you know, maybe even an answer to your prayers. And, and one thing's for sure, as a church, the Bible talks about sharing your testimony and encouraging one another. And so if you've already seen something amazing happen in your world, we want to know about it uh, because we want to be able to encourage others with it. And so you can always email that story to info at, just remember, info at metrochurch.tv. We'd love to know what God's doing in your world. So again, I've already seen God begin to move. And some of the stuff I'm going to share with you today has been some of the move that he's already been doing in me. Um, but if you're joining us, we would love to encourage you to, to join us in the remaining 14 days of our 21 days of fasting and prayer. And um, what level of fasting you'll be a part of is really, it's up to you. It's your choice. This could be fasting one or two meals a day throughout the week. Maybe this is only water, as we see often in the Bible. Or perhaps choose to go on a liquids-only diet, no solid foods, or maybe it's, you know, for the duration, or perhaps just a, a Tuesday and Thursday thing. Look, you're in control when it comes to your prayer and fasting, right? That's something that's important, because here's the thing. You're making a vow. You're the one that's leaning in. You're the one seeking God. Uh, there's nothing worse than when you feel like somebody's demanding you do their thing, right? Your fast should represent a level of challenge, it is important to know your body and your options. Most importantly, seek God in prayer and follow what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Are you getting all this? I talked about it last week. Maybe you supplement your fasts uh, with, you know, cutting out Netflix or the news, right? Or from the time trap of scrolling social media. You are in control, but rededicate that time to prayer, reading, worship, and leaning into things of God. It's not too late to catch up and join us going through the Bible in a year. We've got apps and plans, and we've posted all that on our social media, so you can scroll back while you're still scrolling. Scroll back and, and find that. So there's still time to jump in here. Let's throw this up. Metro Church 2021 Prayer and Fasting. This is what our focus has been. 21 days of personal and prayer and fasting. That's what God is putting on your heart to do. Then there's 72 hours of corporate prayer and fasting. This is what we've been doing from Sundays at 8 p.m. until Mondays at 8 p.m. We've been inviting you, encouraging you, not mandating you to be a part of what God's doing as a corporate body in this church to say, you know what, from 8 p.m. tonight until 8 p.m. tomorrow, we're going to do a fast. Many, many people that have been doing fast for a long time are doing water only, as they see in the Bible. Some people that are, this is just their first time, they may be trying to just do one or two of those meals, but my, my hope is that you actually do something that challenges yourself, not something that you would just do naturally, right? Then, in this 21 days of prayer and fasting, we've chosen three nights of collective prayer gatherings that actually happen on the Monday night to be the finale of our 24-hour fast together. And so we come together. How many enjoyed last Monday's prayer nights? It was, it was something amazing. We, we did something a little different where we were opening up topics and talking about them and then encouraging you to pray where you sit, not just listen to us pray about it, but as a church for us to collectively pray about it. It was a little bit of a change in, in template, and I've heard a lot of great stuff. And so uh, whether you're going to be joining us tomorrow uh, in person or online, look, we're excited to see what God's going to do this year. And so we're encouraging those who, are physic who physically can to join us in our 24 hours of corporate prayer and fasting starting tonight. So I think I covered it all. There, are re there is a reason, though, we call this spiritual discipline. It's because we naturally don't want to do it. I naturally don't want to fast. I naturally want to just say what's on my mind and be done with prayers. But there's something about having the discipline to say, God, even though I don't know what else to say, I don't want to leave you yet. Let me dig deeper and talk to you maybe about another layer, another wrinkle in my heart that maybe we haven't talked much about lately. Okay? And so, again, this is an invitation for you to join us. So, uh, with the remaining time, I'm going to do a miracle and I'm going to preach a whole other message. We've spent the last couple weeks breaking down the scriptures on fasting. I want to shift and focus on prayer. Prayer is vitally important in a believer's life. Prayer to our soul is like oxygen to our bodies. When it comes to the spirit man, the spirit woman, what it means to pray, 
we discount because we live in a natural world in the material. And so oftentimes we can discount the, the uh, importance of prayer. But the reality is our spirit man, our soul man, it needs this time with God. God created us to be in relationship with him. And prayer is the means our hearts and minds stay engaged in that relationship. Oftentimes I talk about, you know, think of some of the closest relationships you have in your life. Maybe it's your wife or your husband. Maybe, uh, you know, it's your, your BFF. Maybe it's your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Uh, keeping it holy, of course. Uh, listen, if all of a sudden you decided, hey, we're going to keep this relationship, but I'm never going to see you. We're not really going to talk. How well is that going to work out? It's not, but yet we think it works out with God and it doesn't. That's why it's so important to pray. It's allowing him to come into our space, into our lives, into our worlds daily and be involved and engaged. So how do I pray? Let me break it down. I'm going to start as if somebody has never, ever been in church before, because if we don't do that, then we actually aren't helping some people. We need to help all people, right? So how do I pray? I've heard many say, I know what prayer is, but how do I do it? I know what prayer is, but how do I do it? So I, I'll try my best to simplify this. Praying is simply talking to God from an honest place. It's talking to God from an honest place. Think of it like this. It's like pulling your closest friend aside and sharing with them the things that are going on in your world. What you're thankful for, what worries you, what you need help with, and what you are hoping for. The hour-long conversation that you would share with your closest friends is the relationship God is eager to have with you. He wants you to pour out your heart to him. He wants you, because someone goes, well, God knows everything, so why should I say it? Well, my wife knows I love her, but why should I tell her? You have to understand the deepest roots of relationship need leaning in. They need conversation. They need dedicated time together. And that's what prayer is with God. It's saying, you're so important that I am going to dedicate this time and we're going to have a talk. Okay? And so <clears throat> this is... Uh, this is, uh, we're going to, the last couple of weeks I've been using some scriptures in Matthew on, uh, you know, Sermon on the Mount where Jesus has finished the Beatitudes and now he's going through principles of living for Christians. And, and it, we've been talking about this, this scripture where it, he says, and when you fast, meaning not if you fast, but this is how you do it when you fast, right? And so again, if people say, well, you know, do we have to fast? Well, Jesus assumed you were going to, that's why he taught us about it right? Um, and, and so today I kind of want to shift in the same chapter. Jesus also says, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. And he teaches us what, uh, what we now know as the Lord's prayer or what's considered the model prayer. And so let's jump in Matthew six. It says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So what is he saying there? Look, at there are people that pray just to look holy. There are people who flaunt their spirituality just to be better than you. There are people who stand on their soapbox, so to speak, and say, look at how holy I am. You must feel bad. He's calling them hypocrites. What is he saying? They're not even really talking to me. Okay? But when you pray... Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Let me just stop for a minute. What does it mean, the, the babbling on... There's no heart behind anything. They're just saying a lot of words to sound spiritual, to sound holy. I actually, can I just for a moment pause and go into a story? I was, I was, um, I was in the mall, which is not unusual, some would know. Um, but I was led that morning to be in the mall. And some people understand the feeling of being led. Um, and so I was in, in the mall that morning, and I actually, as I was going into a shore. You, can we just pause for a minute and just say that there's almost 30 stores in our local mall that are closed right now? Let's just remember that people's livelihood, I mean, 30 stores, that's half of the stores in the mall that are now closed. Do something good. Support a local business. Okay. 
coming back, okay? So as I'm walking through the mall, uh, a, a business owner, a woman, she goes, I, I'm in another store, and this business owner comes into the store that I'm in, and she goes, Pastor Chad? And so I'm in the middle of conversing with the manager of this store, and we have now gone from shoes to church, and we're talking. And so she hears, this manager hears this other person call me Pastor Chad after we had just kind of started talking about what I do and all the rest, right? And so she's kind of like, that was unusual, you know? But, but anyway, so after that happens and she starts asking more questions, you just never know. So I, anyway, I go back over to the other store manager uh, who's got a, a local uh, homegrown shop right there in the mall. And so I start talking and this person starts asking me questions about prayer. And she says that she, you know, she was also raised Catholic and she does her best to pray. And she, she recites this prayer and recites that prayer. And, and, and I just kind of stopped her and I said, look, it's good that you're leaning in to try and pray and doing what you're doing. But what God really wants to hear is what's on your heart, not the prayer you memorized. And I just helped her understand, because it was a question about prayer, right? Because they, this person has been joining us online. They've been watching. They may be watching right now. What up, girl? How are you? Listen, <laughs> but I'm just encouraging people. Look, God wants to hear from your hearts. He wants to hear what's going on in your worlds. And when we come from that honest place, it shifts what's going on. It becomes deeper. If you've ever had a relationship with somebody and they go to a place that once you've started, once they start speaking, you realize they haven't shared this with anyone else. We've just gone to a deeper place. Are you hearing me? That's what prayer has the ability to do. We don't just want to recite prayers that we've been taught. I'm glad it's a starting point, but God wants your hearts. Okay, let's go back to those scriptures. That's what, when I paused. Um, and so this then is how you should pray. And we go into the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's interesting that when we start, when Jesus is teaching us to pray, he says, when you approach God, it's about God, not about you. The very first thing he says is, holy is your name. The fact that you even hear me, let's talk about how good you are. Okay, so your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Then it shifts to me, right? We start with God. It's about his goodness and the fact that he would even hear from us. And then it shifts to me, right? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also forgive our debtors. So it goes from me to me to looking out. Now, not just about taking care of me, but me also considering and caring for those around me and it doesn't just say, my friends, those that I need to forgive. Whew. Okay? As we also have been forgiven our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Continuing. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive your others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sin. So these last two scriptures are after the prayer. He's now talking why we should be considering asking God help me forgive them because if I forgive them, then you still forgive me. We forget there's a transaction there. There's a cost. Now listen, God loves us. He forgives us. But what he doesn't want is uh, he doesn't want to be forgiving you while you create and withhold forgiveness and create bitterness and create issues and do everything opposite of who he is. Are you getting this? And so Jesus is explaining to us how to pray. We need to approach God with reverence in prayer, aligning our will with his. We should praise him while also sharing the things that are heavy on our hearts. So that's how to pray. It's simply talking to God from an honest place. Okay? Why should I pray? Let me go back to the story of me when I, or to the story of pulling your closest friend aside and just talking to them about things going on in your world. We can all relate with that, right? The difference from talking with your closest friends and talking with the God of the universe is miles apart when it comes to potential. I can talk to a close friend and they can hear me and they can encourage me in the words of God if they're that good of a friend, right? But at some point, what are they going to say? I'll pray for you if they're good friends. Okay? There is potential in that. Those friendships are important. But if all I ever do is go to people 
and all they can eventually do for me is pray for me, what is the potential to go directly to the source and talk to him about what's going on in my world? We shouldn't not have friends. We need friends to pray for us. We need friends to stand in the gap for us. We need good people in our world. But if we treat our friends like God, we're in trouble. The potential is miles apart. Are you getting this? And so friends who love you, they'll do what is humanly possible. But inevitably, it's going to probably end with, I'll be praying for you. When we talk to God about what is in our hearts and our minds, when we bring our struggles before him, he is all powerful. God is fully capable and can move on your behalf in the unseen worlds. Are you getting this? I keep saying, are you getting this? Because it's important for you to understand the power of prayer. The church needs to pray more. What does that mean? You need to pray more. Like, did he just say, yes, all of us, we need to pray more. We need to lean into what God is doing. When we talk to God, it's what is on our hearts and minds. When we bring our struggles before him, Again, he is all powerful. He wants to hear your struggles, not just to hear your struggles. He's waiting for you to welcome him into the problem so that he can become an answer. The answer. God, through the Holy Spirit, can move on your behalf in a way no one else can. That's why we pray. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our helper, he's our advocate. In fact, when people didn't want Jesus to leave them. If you go back and look at the disciples, Jesus actually said, it's better that I go so that I can send your helper, the Holy Spirit, your advocates. Why? Because he knew the place we were about to walk, what we were about to begin to tread through, we were going to need the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And that that was so important he needed to leave for. So the question is, If it was so important for Jesus to leave so that we could have the Holy Spirit in our world, how often am I engaging the Holy Spirit who he said I needed in my world? This is something for us to consider. And so, okay, how to pray? Why should I pray? The next one, what does prayer do? What does prayer do? Firstly, it welcomes God into our present world. We talked about this. It welcomes God into, the, into our world to not just be a bystander or an onlooker, but to be active, engaged in helping us in our worlds. Okay? Many of us, uh, or many of which only ever change by his help. There are very few times in your life where you go, oh man, that was easy. I'm glad I got to just take the care of that myself. All right? Think when the last time that happened. I know those stores sell the easy button, but you don't get to push it often. (laughs) The next thing, what does prayer do? It puts the natural world back into context. It puts the natural world back into context. We are not of this world. This is why we shouldn't be controlled by it. This is also why we fast. So we shouldn't be controlled by the world that we're actually foreigners here. The Bible calls us that we are actually foreigners in a foreign land and that we're not of this world. What does that mean? It means you weren't designed for this earth. You were designed for his heaven. And the more I understand God, I got to put this world into context because this is a blip on the radar and I know you've created me to be an eternal being and I'm not going to be here very long. That means the decisions I make here can't be made for a 70 or 80 year focus. It It has to be made with an eternal focus. And the more you live with an eternal focus, the easier it is for you to say no to things that have been holding on to you and bad habits and thought processes. Nope, I'm going to live for the eternal because I'm a foreigner here and I'm getting entangled with foreign affairs. It puts the natural world back into context. It reminds us God controls everything. Okay, Why, what does prayer do? It puts our cares back into God's hands. You know, I always have this thought when it comes to all of my struggles, all of my, my hurts and my pains, all of my baggage, it gives me this word picture in my head with somebody <laughs> trying to hold all of their family's luggage. And inevitably, the burden is on us until we decide that it's not any longer. And if you could imagine just carrying like all of the McAllister's luggage from home alone, trying to get through that airport. Look, 
as long as you carry the baggage, you're not going to go very far. But when I pray, it allows me to remember I can place my burdens in his hands. I can cast my cares upon him. I can, this is what prayer does. It frees me. It frees you. Not that you're no longer having to deal with anything, but knowing that God is inevitably in control. That is so big. You know, <laughs> it allows me to get the thoughts out of my head, the weights off of my heart. This is what it does. It puts it back in God's hands. What else does it do? It, it pulls back the curtain to see what God sees. See, when I'm praying, I'm not just telling him all that's on my heart. I'm saying, God, help me see why this is happening. God, help me understand why we're even here to begin with. God, I thought I avoided this thing. I thought this wasn't going to happen. Help me see what you see, because if there's anything redeemable, I want it redeemed. If there's anything that can be brought back, I want it brought back. I want what's mine, but know what, God? I need to see what you see because there are some things God's trying to put to death in your life that you keep giving CPR to. And then you get frustrated when it gets back up and knocks you down. Prayer, help me see what you see, God. I don't want to be resuscitating the very thing that needs to die in my world. I don't want to be resuscitating the relationship that is pulling me to hell. God, let me see what you see. What else does prayer do? Through prayer, our faith unleashes heaven to move. I pray because it changes things. I pray because it doesn't just have the potential to change the situation. It has the power to change me while changing the situation. Prayer changes things. When I have the ability to stir faith, when we come together and we, we take these, this moment uh, during service and pray for other people's needs, it's not just so that they feel that they're cared for. It's because we believe God moves. It's not just because we say, oh, they'll feel better if we pray about this. It's because we say, God, your word says, I'm only declaring what your word says. And because I believe it, I want to see you move. I want to see you move. Our faith unleashes heaven by activating faith. It opens the doors of heaven to transform me and my situation. Faith, uh, faith is the gasoline that gets God to move. You feel like, man, we just haven't been going anywhere. I just feel like I'm running in place. I feel like I'm just sitting here. Well, have we stirred some faith to allow ourselves or to allow God to move us from A to B? God works by faith. Yes. What does prayer do? Answered prayers build our trust in God. You know, something my wife is really good at um, is prayer journaling. Prayer journaling. And, and some people that may not have, have heard this concept, it's literally rather than sitting and praying, she's praying while she writes. She's writing her prayers down, the things that she's praying for, the, the, you know, what she's hoping God to do, what, what can be seen. Because here's the beauty, beautiful thing about it. Oftentimes when we pray about something, you know, God will do something and we can miss it. But when you reopen your prayer journal and you realize that you're living in an answer that you forgot about, that you'd prayed about three weeks ago, and God showed up, now you go, wait a minute. God is moving. It didn't go unnoticed because I have found, uh, if, if you can just remember the things God's already done, it helps you stir prayer for the things that are still needed, right? And so answered prayers build our trust in God. When we pray about something and see God answer, we have the ability to grow closer and praise him in a more grateful way. We know God came to our aid. It's that moment of going, wow, God, you do it, and so you can do it again, you know? Can I help some of you out there? who feel discouraged. Maybe you've prayed about situations or people for a very long time and not seen the fruit or breakthrough that you hoped for. Firstly, you're not alone. You're not alone. Secondly, if we turn away from prayer and continuing to believe, how will that help the situation? Don't allow your frustration to push you from the only person that can ha hear your prayer. Right? Thirdly, look, sometimes in the Bible we see, we see that their faith has to make them well. There are sometimes we see where someone stands in the gap and, and because they stood in the gap, that person was healed because they prayed for him. There are other times in the Bible where Jesus said, because of your faith, you are made well. Look, I'm never going to stop praying for somebody, but I do have to realize they need faith too. Okay, 
So I'm just trying to encourage you. Look, don't stop praying just because you haven't seen something. But maybe you should start encouraging the one that you're praying for to start praying to. Okay? All right. Not sure who that was for. But no, seriously, know that God cares. I've got to move on. Oh, what should I pray? And this is my final point, and that's a good thing. Look at what I'm about to share hopefully will help you in your prayer time. As, as we enter into our second week of prayer and fasting, I believe this should help bring a real focus in your prayer time and help you sustain the length of your prayer time. Look, one thing that I'm always challenged by is when I'm, I'm fasting a meal, it normally takes me 15 to 20 minutes to eat. And then I go and I pray for two to three minutes and I feel like, God, I, I don't really have much more to say, but I want to dedicate this time. I'm going to sit in your presence and wait for you to speak to me. I really believe if we can sit on the phone and talk to our friend for an hour, we can dig deeper in our prayer time with God. Right? And so, listen, <clears throat> I think what I'm about to share with you should help sustain the length of the time you pray. And so, I don't know about you, but prayer doesn't always come easy to me. Maybe it's because the creative in me can find it difficult to live in, anal in an analytical part of my brain for too long. Squirrel. <laughs> You see? And so, but what I'm going to share with you is a progression God gave me in my time of prayer and fasting. This is something that God gave me, and I believe it can help you. And I'm calling it PC's Guide to Focused Prayer Time, which is kind of funny because the idea of me focused sometimes is funny. <laughs> but listen, I woke up and was praying, and I got this he, me, we, us, our, all. Let me explain what that means, because to me, it, it totally revolutionized my time in praying. First of all, as I went and I looked at God's word and, and, and in the model prayer Jesus taught us, it has to start with him. It's got to be he. It's got to be God. My prayer time has to enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. It's got to be about his goodness, the fact that he even hears me, the fact that he has drawn me to himself in which, God, you are so good. Right now, you're even hearing me. Out of every person on the planet, you don't just hear me, you know me. It's got to start with he, God's goodness. Holy are you, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Remember Matthew 6, 9, and 10? This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I'll just keep praying about God's goodness. I'll start from a place of thankfulness. I'll thank God for who he is. I start with the he, but then it shifts. After, I've, after I'm worn out of praying about him, which could go on forever. But the reality is there's weights on me about other things, aren't there? That's why we, we enter prayer, because we have reason to pray. So it goes from he to me. Okay, God, I need you to forgive me for whatever I don't even know I've done. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to purify me. Lord, I want to be set apart. Change me, right? The thoughts and actions and words. God, I want a personal revival within me. I want to be set apart. God, I want you to use me. It goes from him to me. God, there are things that I got to get off my chest. There are things that I need you to forgive me for. There are bad decisions I've recently made maybe, right? All these things because the reality is we have to come before God with a clean heart. Clean hands and a pure heart, so to speak, yes? And so uh, look what it says in, in Psalms 51. It says, Created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Went from he to me. But from me, it goes to we. Now I talk... God, just about my family, about my pack, about, about those under my roof and my extended family, I start to pray for them. Because guess what? God has put you in that pack. He's put you in your family. And there are people in your family that maybe you don't see eye to eye with, but the reality is you need to be praying for them. 
And so I begin to pray about my family's health, about my family's struggles, about my family's blessings and thanking him for it. I continue to go uh, through this we. What, what is that? Look at, I, I love this. In Romans it says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So know what I pray? I pray for my family to be filled with complete joy and peace. As we trust in God, I, I take time to pray for an overflow of hope in my house through the power of the Holy Spirit. I begin to pray about my household. I go from he to me to we. Then I go to us, his church. Then I begin to pray about the church family, whether it's locally and globally. Let your church rise up. Bless us and empower us to be your hands and feet, O Lord. Look what it says. I, I love this. Uh, in Numbers, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons. Now, Aaron and his sons were the, the priests of that time. So he said, Go tell them to do this. What? This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Look at that's the prayer for the church. Lord, bless us, keep us. Lord, I know that times are going to get harder and harder, but your church, I pray that you would give us deep roots so that we could stand for you when no one else is willing to stand so that we'd be willing to be devoted to you when everyone else says that that's old and past and that that's not what's trending now. God, let us be your church. Let us rise up. If you're not praying for the church, you've got to question how much of the church you are. I go from he to me to we to us as church to our, our nation. Our country, our nation, healing and restoration, peace. And what can bring all of that is revival. I pray for revival for this nation. God, revive in this nation a spirit that fears you, that loves you, that seeks you, that wants you above all else, that puts aside the pettiness of left and right and just looks to you. God, if we could focus on you, everything could change. Look what it says in 2 Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their lands. Pray for your country. Pray for your nation. Not because we're the only nation that needs prayer, but because if we pray, God can heal our land. He, to me, to we, to us, to our, to all. At that point, whatever is on my heart, I just give it all to him. At that point, I call it the open table. I'm going to put everything on the table. Now I'm going to talk to you, Lord, about this struggle. Now I'm going to talk to you about this situation. Now I'm going to talk to you about the need for this breakthrough. I'm, I'm just going to make sure that I don't leave this place until all of it's off my heart, until all of the burden has been laid down, until I know that you're helping me carry this, Lord God. I'm going to lay it all down so that when I say amen and I get up and walk away, man, I know I've given everything that was on my heart to you. I promise you, if you're somebody like me who struggles with focus, try and enact this into your prayer life and see what it does. See how much more focused you are. And know what? I'm telling you, journal about it. Because then when you see God do something, weeks later, months later, years later, you open that book back up and you start going through your prayers and you realize you're living in the sweet promised land of the prayer you were looking for and it doesn't go unnoticed. <laughs> prayer changes things, church. And when I talk about all, Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The reason I know that I can pray about anything is God wants to hear what's on my heart. He says, present it to him. I love the way the message puts it. Check out this. It says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. 
Letting God know your concerns before you know it. A sense of God's wholeness. Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Man, when it comes to me giving all, God, I'm putting everything from my heart to the table. I want you to know it. I want to pray about this. God, I need you in my life. I need you to answer this. God's just excited that we are petitioning him, that we are casting our cares, that we are bringing it all to him. Prayer changes situations, circumstances, attitudes, emotions. It breaks down strongholds, but most importantly, it changes us. And as we close today, I wouldn't even think about gathering together without saying a prayer that can change everything for somebody. With every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you're in this room, whether you're at home, whether you're on the other side of the lens, wherever you are, listen, God loves you so much. He wants not just to be a part of your life, he wants to transform your life for the good, for better. Maybe today you're saying, I don't know much more than what I've heard today. Listen to me. God loved you so much, he sent his only son from heaven, Jesus, to live the life that we couldn't, a perfect, sinless life. It sounds crazy, but the only way to redeem a lost world is through something like this. And so Jesus came to this earth. earth. He lived the life that we couldn't. He then chose death so that we wouldn't have to eternally die. He went to the cross for your sins and mine. But the cross wasn't the end. The grave couldn't hold him, and three days later, he rose again. The reality is, in the same way that death couldn't hold him, death won't be the end for us. Death has lost its sting. And today, you have the ability to say yes to Jesus. You have the ability to say, God, I lay everything else down, and I seek you. Today, I'd love to lead you in that prayer. And if you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer. I want to experience God's grace and mercy, his love, his forgiveness. Well, this is the first step. It's accepting that you need a savior and that the only one that can save is Jesus Christ. So today I want to help you accept Christ into your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place and you're saying, Pastor Chad, pray for me. No one else is looking around. This is between you and God, but I just want to know who am I praying for? If that's you, if you're on the other side of this lens and that's you, just quickly in this moment, slip up your hand. I see that hand and that hand. Come on, anyone else, I see that hand. And if that's you at home, I'm talking to you as well. Come on, church, let's all say this prayer together. Let's say, God, I thank you that you love me so much. You created a way, an off-ramp from sin and all that I deserve to an on-ramp to forgiveness, mercy, heaven, and all that I don't deserve. But because of Jesus, you made a way. Today, I accept you, Jesus. Come into my heart. Forgive me. Give me a new start. Holy Spirit, help me to live the purpose I was created for. I am yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, can we give everyone a huge hand that made that decision? How exciting. Look, if you made that decision, this is just the beginning of an amazing prayer journey, an amazing faith walk. What God is going to do in your life is going to be amazing, but you've got to lean into it. The Bible says that we don't just say, God, forgive me of my sin. We actually leave our sin behind. It creates this new walk to say, God, I want what you want for my life. I don't want to just fit you into where you fit. I want to be living a life for you. And so the church wants to come alongside you and help you on this journey. If you made that decision, you're saying, what's next? Simply text the word next to 55444. And we'd love to send this to you. If you're in this building right now, there's one of these in the seat back in front of you. It's a what on earth am I here for? It's a a little booklet that helps give you a bunch of scripture about God's purpose for our lives. And just before we close, let me just remind you, church family, for those that would like to to join us, we're going to begin another 24-hour fast tonight at 8 p.m. You decide how you would like to be involved, but we would like to finish that 24-hour fast at 7 p.m. together tomorrow. 
with a prayer night. And so whether you have the ability to be with us or whether you're gonna be with us online, church, I believe that 2021 isn't just a figure, figurative thing, a new year. I believe God wants us winning in 2021, W-O-N. I think he wants us to win. I think he wants to bring new things into our world. But you know what? We've got to sow the seed now. And so join us for that. And otherwise, you know what? You know, you know. Church, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I'll see you again soon.